In this presentation, we will consider 3rd Nephi, chapter 27, through 4th Nephi. So we'll take a look at some of the doctrines and principles and teachings and what we learn about coming unto Christ in 3rd Nephi 27 through 4th Nephi. So let's begin with 3rd Nephi 27. 27 verses 1 through 4. Many of the great revelations in the scriptures came a result of questions prophets had have pondered in regard to difficult issues. Those recorded in this chapter, one of the most significant in third Nephi, came in that way. The twelve were seeking the answer from the Lord as to what the new church he had established among them should be called. There had been disputations among the people concerning this matter. We do not know the specific nature of these disputations, but we can assume that they were serious enough that the disciples were deeply troubled by the matter and had come before the Lord in mighty prayer and fasting to petition him for clarification. As they have had wrestled with the issue, pondered deeply upon it, and come to no resolution of the problem, they then were spiritually prepared to turn to the Lord for guidance and direction beyond their own reasoning. This is the process by which revelation comes. Chapter 27, verses 4 through 5. Why is it that people should murmur and dispute because of this thing? It appears that the Savior was somewhat surprised that there should even be any question concerning this matter. He told him that there should, that there would be, uh, should be be, not he, I'm sorry. That there would be no disputations among the church members if they but understood the scriptures. In the modern church, too, we often find members disputing over church practices, programs, and even doctrines. Such murmuring and contention could be eliminated by a deeper understanding of the scriptures and of the eternal principles of the gospel that underline those church practices. Just as the Savior taught the disciples that the answers to their questions was found in the scriptures, so too have heavenly messengers appeared in our dispensation in response to prophetic pleadings and ponderings, and have recited scriptures scripture that open mortal understanding. President Harold B. Lee often taught and exemplified that the scriptures can provide answers to all of life's difficult questions. Quote, he said, I say that we need to teach our people to find their answers in the scriptures. President Lee declared, if only each of us would be wise enough to say that we aren't able to answer any question unless we can find a doctrinal answer in the scriptures. And if we hear someone teaching something that is contrary to what is in the scriptures, each of us may know whether the things spoken are false. It is as simple as that. But the unfortunate thing is that so many of us are not reading the scriptures. We do not know what is in them, and therefore we speculate about the things that we ought to have found in the scriptures themselves. I think that therein is one of our biggest dangers of today. End of quote. Elder Robert D. Hells, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the relationship between taking upon us the name of Christ and the law of obedience and receiving the blessings of the companionship of the Holy Ghost. Quote, when we are baptized, we take upon ourselves the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Taking upon us his name is one of the most significant experiences we have in life. Yet sometimes we pass through that experience without having a full understanding. How many of our children, how many of us really understand that when we are baptized, we took upon us not only the name of Christ, but also the law of obedience? Each week in sacrament meeting, we promise to remember the atoning sacrifice of our Savior as we renew our baptismal covenant. We promise to do as the Savior did, to be obedient to the Father and always keep His commandments. The blessings we receive in return is to always have His Spirit to be with us. End of quote. Chapter 27, 7 through 8, the phrase, Whatsoever ye shall do, ye shall do it in my name. The Lord had previously taught the people, both personally and by his prophets, that they should do all things in his name. With that as the foundation, Jesus now taught that it is not only reasonable, 
but imperative that the church be called after him. If it be called after a man, then it is a man's church, but there is no salvation in a man's church or immortal works. The name is only one of the attributes of which Jesus spoke concerning his only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. There are many churches that have the name of Jesus Christ or a derivative in that official title, but that alone does not mean that they are the kingdom of God on earth. The Savior said that it becomes his church if it be called in my name and also is built upon my gospel. The, lame, the name alone is insufficient. The true church of Jesus Christ will undoubtedly bear his holy name, but it also must be built upon, preach and practice his gospel as he has conveyed it to the earth, both through his prophets and through his own personal ministry. These verses concerning the name of the church serve as a preface to Savior's subsequent teaching about the gospel on which the church must be built. 27, 9 through 12. The phrase, I say unto you, that ye are built upon my gospel, therefore ye shall call whatsoever things ye do in my name. The true church of Jesus Christ is built upon the true gospel, and as a result will bring forth good fruits. Gifts of the Spirit and the blessings of authorized priest administrations are poured out by God upon the church as a blessing to the saints, and as signs of his acceptance of it. A church that is not built upon the Lord's true church may have temporary success, produce some good works, and possess some spiritual fruits given through the grace of God to bless his children and to lead them to the truths and salvation that are available only through his true church and kingdom. Ultimately, however, those churches and organizations are not built upon Christ's gospel and are without his authorization and approval that, however well-intentioned, are in doctrinal, however well intentioned, there are in doctrinal error, overthrown by the power. Let me try that again. Ultimately, however, those churches and organizations that are not built upon Christ's gospel and are without his authorization and approval, that, however well intentioned, are in doctrinal error, overthrown by the power of God. There is but one way to the Father, and that is through Christ and his gospel. The works of the wicked and the labors of men are not acceptable to God outside the parameters of the gospel, because a man being evil cannot do that which is good. For if he offereth gift or prayeth unto God, and not with real intent of heart, it profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth none such. Chapter 27, verse 11, They have joy in their works for a season. God allows even the wicked to take temporary pleasure in their works of wickedness and their worldly lifestyles, but he knows that ultimately wickedness cannot and will not produce lasting happiness and eternal joy. Some may experience a degree of happiness in following worldly standards because their level of understanding and behavior harmonizes with those standards. But as their understanding of the ideals of Christ-like living is increased, as it will be for all mankind as they are taught the gospel in this life, or the next, and when all knees bow in sacred deference to Christ, the discrepancy between their mortal behavior and the gospel ideals will be so great as to destroy their mortal, short-lived pleasures in their wicked works. A fullness of joy, lasting eternal happiness, may be obtained only through obedience to those principles of the gospel that leads the man of Christ in a straight, narrow course across ever that everlasting gulf of misery. Chapter 27, 13 through 22. This is the gospel which I have given you. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that the simplicity of the gospel is the very reason some people find the gospel so difficult to accept. Quote, he said, There is in the Book of Mormon a statement in which the Lord says, Behold, this is the gospel which I have given you. And then he describes his gospel. It is a simple story of a world to which a Savior has been sent, whom men must accept or reject, but who is nevertheless the Messiah. That simple story is the very thing, of course, the world cannot accept, and it is so simple that some may even be offended inwardly at times by the so-called simplicity of the gospel. There are those who may share some of our beliefs and values, but for whom the restoration of the gospel is a stumbling block. 
They cannot get over the top of it. But to most of mankind, what we proclaim is foolishness. End of quote. A Savior himself defined his gospel as faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. He also stated that the gospel was him coming into the world to do the Father's will and to be lifted up upon the cross. Chapter 27, 13 through 15. In these verses, we receive one of the most significant contributions to our standing of what constitutes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Earlier, the Lord had declared those principles that comprise his gospel. These verses, however, give life a meaning to those principles. The gospel is truly the life, mission, teaching, atoning sacrifice, death, and resurrection of Christ. The good news and glad tidings in the gospel are found in Christ, in his atonement, not just in his teachings. Ella Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, Nothing in the entire plan of salvation compares in any way in importance with the atoning sacrifice of our Lord. It is the rock foundation upon which the gospel and all other things rest. It is the foundation upon which all truths rest, and all things grow out of it and come because of it. Indeed, the atonement is the gospel. Chapter 27, verse 14, that I might draw all men unto me. If Jesus had not met the demands of justice and provided mercy through his atonement, the principles of faith, repentance, baptism, and so forth would have had no power to draw us to him and back to the Father. Because he has fulfilled the Father's will, Christ has the power to draw us, to entice or invite us to those principles and powers that enable us to return to the Father. Eternal life is not imposed upon us against our will, but is held out to us as a spiritual enticement and blessing. We accept the atonement and obtain the blessings of eternal life only through our own agency. We are drawn unto Christ, not dragged. Chapter 27, 14. The phrase, Even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, the effects of the fall of Adam are swallowed up in victory because Jesus was lifted up upon the cross and resurrected by the power of God. All mankind will be lifted up, resurrected and brought back into the presence of God to be judged of their works. The lifting up of all mankind spoken of here and also in verse 15 refers to the unconditional and universal redemption from the fall. In this sense, all men and women are delivered at least temporarily from spiritual death, inasmuch as they will be brought before God to be judged. In other words, because of the resurrection, we will all get back into the presence of God. We don't have to do anything to get back in His presence. The resurrection will take care of that. But if you want to stay in God's presence and have His kind of life and live with Him, then you must be obedient to the ordinance and covenants of the gospel and through repentance upon the atonement of Jesus Christ. Chapter 27, verse 15. For this cause have I been lifted up. It is obvious from the context of verses 14 and 15 that the meaning of Jesus' being lifted up is the image of him being crucified and lifted up on the cross. It may be, however, that it involves more than this. In order to fulfill the atonement and draw all men unto him, it was requisite that he be lifted up as a light to the world, that his example and teachings might draw men to him, and he be lifted up into heaven as a glorified God who was, has fulfilled the commandments given him of the Father. Each of these images, his perfect example, his death on the cross, and his glorified ascension into heaven, helps us to see how his being lifted up brings us to him and lifts us up, not only to eternal life in the world to come, but to a more abundant life in this mortal sphere. Chapter 27, verses 16 through 22. If he endureth to the end, behold, him will I hold guiltless before my Father. In these verses, the Savior reiterates those principles and ordinances of the gospel which, with which we must comply in order to, fulfill, to fully embrace and benefit from the atonement, namely, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism by water and by the Spirit, enduring to the end resurrection and eternal judgment. 
Without observing these vital elements of the gospel, one cannot be held guiltless and will not be found spiritually spotless before the Lord. Viewed from our mortal position, wrote Ella Bruce on McConkie, the gospel is all that is required to take us back to the eternal presence, there to be crowned with glory and honor, immortality and eternal life. To gain these greatest of all rewards, two things are required. The first is the atonement by which all men are raised in immortality, with those who believe and obey ascending also unto eternal life. This atoning sacrifice was the work of our blessed Lord, and he has done his work. The second requisite is obedience on our part to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Thus the gospel is, in effect, the atonement. But the gospel is also all the laws, principles, doctrines, rites, ordinances, acts, powers, authorities, and keys needed to save and exalt fallen man in the highest heaven hereafter. End of quote. Chapter 27, verse 17, He that endureth not unto the end, the same as he that is also hewn down and cast into the fire. In this context, those who do not endure to the end, those who do not continually exercise faith in the name of Christ, who refuse to obey his commandments, and who will not demonstrate their love for their fellow man through service, compassion, and forgiveness. The eternal life producing endurance requires an enduring change of heart and life. That comes only through the atonement. Without such, a person can neither endure to the end nor attain exaltation in our Father's kingdom. Chapter 27, verse 19, noting, Nothing entereth into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood. The rest of the Lord, to which Jesus is referring this verse, undoubtedly is ultimate exaltation in the presence of God. But other definitions of the phrase, rest of the Lord, would likewise apply. The rest of the Lord could be the earthly peace and spiritual rest from the turmoil and turmoil of the soul. The righteous, meaning those whose garments have been made white in Christ's blood, are also enter the rest of the Lord at death when they enter paradise. The cleansing power of the atonement also enables the person to enter into the personal presence of the Savior, which too is the rest of the Lord. It is interesting to note the symbolism here used here by the Savior to teach the sanctifying, cleansing power of the infinite and eternal sacrifice of the Lamb of God. How do sin-stained garments become pure white when immersed in the blood of Christ? Mortal blood is a staining agent itself, but somehow, spiritually speaking, the blood spilled by a God in our behalf becomes the only true cleansing agent. We cannot cleanse our stained, sin-stained lives by mere washing in the strong detergent of self-discipline. It requires a celestial cleanser, one which we cannot purchase for ourselves, but is purchased for us by the grace of God, the blood of Christ. Chapter 27, verse 20, the phrase that they, ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost. Sanctification is the process by which the saints of God are cleansed from the effects of sin, spiritually renewed, and prepared to enter into the presence of God. The atonement makes this process possible, and the Holy Ghost is the vehicle or means by which it is fulfilled. The Spirit is the means by which human hearts are made pure before God, whereby dross and iniquity are burnt out of the soul as if by fire, and by which the Lord can come to live in us. Chapter 27, verse 21, For the works which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do, being one with Christ through faith and righteousness and ever leads to oneness in action, thinking his thoughts, speaking his words, performing his works. Submission to God and yielding our hearts to him will bring this kind of obedience. Doing the works of Christ does not necessarily mean that we will perform those miracles or utter those prophecies that are so great that they cannot be recorded. But it means that we can live our lives so that we can enjoy the companionship of the Spirit, participate in miracles as when appropriate, and teach with power and authority in His service. 
Becoming Christ-like in thought and deed does not occur suddenly or miraculously, but is a continual process. There is no one greater thing that man can do and then do no more and obtain salvation, taught Elder B. H. Roberts. It is by resisting a temptation today, overcoming a weakness tomorrow, forsaking evil associations the next day, and thus day by day, month after month, year after year, pruning, restraining, and weeding out that which is evil in the disposition that the character is purged of its imperfections. Nor is it enough that one get rid of evil. He must do good. He must cultivate noble sentiments by performing noble deeds, not great ones necessarily, for opportunity to do what the world esteems great things comes, but seldom to men in the ordinary walks of life. But noble deeds may be done every day, and every such deed performed with an eye single to the glory of God draws one that much nearer into the harmony with deity. End of quote. Chapter 27, verse 26. All things are written by the Father. Mankind is judged out of the books that the Father has caused to be written, both earthly and heavenly records. We do not know precisely what role the various types of records kept on earth or in heaven will play in the final judgment. As we have already discussed, the scriptures are the primary book or standard of judgment against which we are judged according to our works. What records has the Father caused to be written that contain our works? Some have the mistaken notion that we are followed around by some guardian angel with a large notebook who diligently keeps track of all our deeds. We often view it as some type of spiritual ledger, with our assets of righteousness in one column and our liabilities of wickedness in the other. In reality, the record of our deeds which the Father has caused to be written is kept within our own souls. My understanding of these things is that God has made each man a register with himself, taught President John Taylor, and each man can read his own register so far as he enjoys his perfect faculties. The spirit lives where the record of his deeds is kept. That does not die. Man cannot kill it. There is no decay associated with it, and it still retains in all its vividness the remembrance of that which transpired before the separation by death of the body and the ever-living spirit. It would be in vain for man to say then, I did not do so and so. The command would be, unravel and read the record which he has made of himself and let it testify in relation to these things and all could gaze upon it that record will stare him in the face he tells the story himself and bears witness against himself when we get into the eternal world into the presence of god our heavenly father his eye can penetrate every one of us and our own record of our lives here will develop all Elder Bruce R. McConkie has also confirmed this view when he wrote, The book of life is the record of the acts of men, as such record is written in their own bodies. It is the record engraven on the very bones, sinews, and flesh of the mortal body. That is, every thought, word, and deed has an effect on the human body. All these leave their mark, marks which can be read by him who is eternal, as easily as the words in the book can be read. By obedience to the telestial law, men obtain telestial bodies. Test terrestrial laws lead to terrestrial bodies. And conformity to celestial law, because this law includes the sanctum power of the Holy Ghost, results in the conditions of a body which is clean, pure, and spotless, a celestial body. Men's bodies will show what law they have lived. End of quote. This record of our deeds, kept within our own souls, will not only show what we have done, but what we are, appearing as we really are, our lives in comparison to the words the Father commanded to be recorded in the Scriptures, will provide the means by which the Father can judge us out of the books according to our works. 27 verse 27, What manner of men ought ye to be? Elder John M. Madsen of the Seventy focused particularly on the word ought in the Lord's teachings to become like he is. Elder Madsen described the Lord's words as more than an invitation, 
but a requirement of our covenants, quote, to receive him and know him, we and all mankind must, as Moroni exhorts, come unto Christ and be perfected in him. In other words, we must come unto Christ and strive to become like him. End of quote. Said the risen Lord, What manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. The meaning of the word ought as used in his quotation. I'm sorry, I'm still quoting Elder Matson. What manner of men ought ye to be is crucial to understanding his answer, even as I am. The word ought means to be necessary, or to be held or bound in duty or moral obligation, suggesting and the Holy Scriptures ancient and modern confirm that it is necessary and that we are bound as by covenant to be as he declared, even as I am. The end of Elder Madsen's quote. 27 verse 28, Whatsoever thing ye shall ask the Father in my name shall be given unto you. The key phrase in this verse is, in my name. Asking in the name of God or Christ means to ask according to the will of of God. We pray in Christ's name when our mind is the mind of Christ and our wishes the wishes of Christ when his words abide in us. We then ask for things it is possible for God to grant. Many prayers remain unanswered because they are not in Christ's name at all. They in no way represent his mind but spring out of the selfishness of man's heart. That's from the Bible Dictionary under the heading of prayer. 27 verse 32, even as we the son of perdition, even as was the son of perdition. The question frequently arises regarding the eternal status of Judas Iscariot. Was he a son of perdition thereof and did actually deny the truth and defy that power having denied the Holy Ghost? after he had received it, and also denied the only begotten after God had revealed him unto him, then there can be no doubt that he will die the second death. That Judas did partake of all this knowledge, that these great truths had been revealed to him, that he had received the Holy Spirit by the gift of God, and was therefore qualified to commit the unpardonable sin, is not as clear to me. To my mind, it strongly appears that not one of the disciples possessed sufficient light, knowledge, or wisdom at the time of the crucifixion for, the, for either exaltation or condemnation. For it was afterwards that their minds were opened to understand the scriptures and that they were endowed with power from on high, without which they were only children in knowledge in comparison to what they afterwards became under the influence of the Spirit. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has likewise written, quote, Jesus' ministry, of where Jesus's ministry, where the twelve are concerned, has succeeded. He has cared for the spiritual well-being of the souls entrusted to him. Only Judas has been lost, and even he, though a son or follower of Satan, who is perdition, as we have therefore seen, is probably not a son of perdition in the sense of eternal damnation. Remember that the Holy Ghost was not given while Christ was upon the earth. It was until after he left that the disciples received the Holy Ghost. And without a witness from the Holy Ghost, a true witness of Jesus Christ, one cannot become a son of perdition. And so the apostles would not have had that. Judas would not have had the gift of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 27, verse 32 they will sell me for silver and for gold. This is a strong image connoting idolatry, the worship of man-made gods in lieu of the God of Israel. They each trample under their feet the things of God and go a-whoring after other things of the world that cannot satisfy the spiritual hunger within the souls and does not produce the fruit of joy of which the Savior just spoke. In a literal sense, Judas sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver, but in a spiritual sense, we sell Christ, betray him, any time the things of the world are more important to us than the things of God. Third Nephi chapter 28. 28 verses 1 through 6. Desires and ministry of John the Beloved. 
The prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received specific revelation through the Urim and Thummim regarding the circumstances and subsequent blessing of John's request to tarry in the flesh. This information was from a parchment written and hidden by John himself, but apparently lost. In April 1829, Joseph and Oliver's specific question on this passage of Book of Mormon resulted in the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 6 and 6. Section 7, which reads, And the Lord said unto me, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For if you shall ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. And I said unto him, Lord, give me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, because thou desirest this, thou shalt tarry until I come in my glory, and shalt prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And for this cause the Lord said unto Peter, If I will that he tarrieth till I come, what is that to thee? For he desired of me that he might bring souls unto me, but thou desirest that thou might speedily come unto me in my kingdom. I say unto thee, Peter, this was a good desire. But my beloved had desired that he might do more or a greater work among the children of men than what he has before done. Yea, he has undertaken a greater work. Therefore I will make him a flaming fire and a ministering angel. He shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation, who dwell on the earth. And I will make thee to minister for him, and for thy brother James, and unto thee three will I give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. Verily I say unto you, ye shall both have according to your desires, for ye both joy and wit in that which ye have desired. That's Doctrine and Covenants 6, 7, 1 through 8. Chapter 28, verses 9 through 10, and verses 36 through 40. The Doctrine of Translation. The following definitions help clarify the doctrine of translation, transfiguration, and resurrection. Notice the difference between translated beings and the mere temporary state of transfiguration. Translated beings are persons who are changed so that they do not exercise pain or death until their resurrection to immortality. Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and to an endless fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of a terrestrial order and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, and who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Transfiguration is the condition of persons who are temporarily changed in appearance and nature, that is, lifted to a higher spiritual level so they can endure the presence and glory of heavenly beings. So that would be Joseph Smith in the Grove of Trees. He was temporarily transfigured, transfiguration, so that he could endure the presence of the Father and Son. And once they left, then this transfiguration left, and he went back to his mortal state. Resurrection is the reuniting of the spirit body with the physical body of flesh and bones after death. After resurrection, the spirit and body will never again be separated, and the person will become immortal. Joseph Smith taught now it was evident that there was a better resurrection or else God would not have revealed it unto Paul. Wherein then can it be said a better resurrection? This distinction is made between the doctrine of the actual resurrection and translation. Translation obtains deliverance from the tortures and sufferings of the body, but their existence will prolong as to the labors and toils of the ministry before they can enter into a great arrest and glory. So being translated is just that your body is changed to a terrestrial body so that you continue work here upon this earth and you don't die. But you will later then be resurrected and attain a fullness of God. It's joy. Ella Bruce R. McConkie has written, Some mortals have been translated. In this state they are not subject to sorrow except for the sins of the world or to disease or to death. No longer does blood, the life-giving element of our present mortality, flow in their veins. 
procreation ceases if they then had children their offspring would then be denied a mortal probation which all worthy spirits must receive in due course they have power to move and live in both a mortal and an unseen sphere all translated beings undergo another change in their bodies when they gain full immortality this change is the equivalent to a resurrection millennial man will live in a state akin to translation his body will be changed so that no longer subject is no longer subject to disease or death as we know it. Although lie all day as we know it, although it will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to full immortality when it is a hundred years of age. I'm sorry, that is should be it chapter 28 verse 7 ye shall never taste of death all men and women die no person not even a translated being in translated beings immunity no person not even translated being immunity f has immunity from death Joseph Smith taught that translated bodies cannot enter into the rest until they have undergone a change equivalent to death. The righteous, which would include translated beings, though they face death, do not taste death. Paul taught that the sting of death is sin. Thou shalt live together in love, Christ counseled his Latter-day Saints, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die, and more specifically for those that have no hope of a glorious resurrection. And it shall come to pass that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. For translated beings, death is, that should be is, it shall come to pass that die in me, for translated beings, death is postponed in order that they can continue their ministries. So this phrase should be, no person, not even translated beings, has immunity from death. Sorry about these typos. I thought I'd catch them all. It's amazing what you don't catch. Let's go to 3 Nephi chapter 29, 29, 1 through 4. That these sayings shall come unto the Gentiles according to his word. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles wrote of the role of the Book of Mormon plays in the fulfilling of God's covenant with respect to Israel. Quote, Mormon concluded his description of this majestic season, the visit of the Savior among the Nephites, by testifying that when a record of Jesus Christ's visit would come to the Gentiles in the form of the Book of Mormon, then all might know that the covenant and promise of Israel of the last days were already beginning to be fulfilled. God's covenant will be kept with all of his covenant people. No one will be able to turn to the right hand of the Lord and to the left on this matter. And the call to the Gentiles for which Christ's visit to Nephites published in the Book of Mormon is the ultimate Latter-day Declaration is for them to claim the same covenant and promises. End of quote. It matters precious little what people of the world may think of the Lord's promise regarding the glorious destiny of the house of Israel. Skepticism or disbelief cannot disannul the Abrahamic covenant. God has sworn and will not repent. His word is sure. On it, may re re on it we may rely with absolute faith. The Book of Mormon is a serious business. It cannot simply be dismissed with a nod of the head or a flip of the hand. It is God Almighty's testimony. He is the author, and those who spurn at its message, be they on faith or atonement or gathering, do so at the peril of their eternal souls. Salvation itself is at stake. 29 verse 4, the phrase, these sayings, meaning the Book of Mormon. 29, 4 through 8, do not spurn the words of the Lord. In 3 Nephi 29, the words spurn and hiss are used to warn Book of Mormon readers in the latter days to not treat lightly the Lord's covenant with Israel. 
Spurn means to reject with disdain, and hiss is to express contempt or dis disappropriation by hissing. The use of such terms suggests that in the time of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, there will be a pronounced lack of understanding, belief, and reverence for both the reality of the second coming and the work of the Lord in the gathering of Israel, especially the tribe of Judah. Let's turn to Third Nephi chapter 30. 30 verse 2, turn from your wicked ways. At the conclusion of the Savior's visit among the Nephites, Mormon returned to what was a major theme of the Lord's instructions among the people, that in the last days the Gentiles will reject the teachings of the Lord and grow rapidly in wickedness to their destruction. The writings in 3 Nephi seem to have had a profound effect upon Mormon. In his final testimony, Mormon revisited the Savior's teachings and prophecies condemning the wicked and perverse and the pollutions and hypocrisies of the last days. In the last verse of 3 Nephi, Mormon offered the only antidote to these destructive conditions. Come unto Jesus Christ and have faith in Him. Repent of your sins, be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Ghost, that ye may be numbered with my people who are of the house of Israel. Now we go to 4th Nephi, chapter 1, Introduction. 4th Nephi covers the nearly 200 years of unity and harmony following Jesus Christ's visit to the Americas. The people were all converted unto the Lord, resulting in society that people of all ages have dreamed of. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve of the Apostles observed that following Christ's visit, quote, His majestic teachings and ennobling spirit led to the happiest of all times, a time in which there was no contention and disputation among them, and every man did deal justly one with another, and they had all things common among them. Therefore they were not rich or poor, bond or free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. That blessed circumstance was, I suppose, achieved on only one other occasion of which we know, the city of Enoch, where they were of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. End of quote. Tragically, the second half of 4th Nephi reveals how a righteous and happy people allowed pride and apostasy to enter their lives, bringing the eventual destruction of their society. As you study this book of scripture, seek to understand what led to the happiness of the Nephite society as well as what led to the misery and destruction of their society. Chapter, or fourth Nephi chapter one, what is the millennium? The guide to the scripture states, the thousand year period of peace that will begin with Christ return will begin when Christ returns to reign personally on the earth. We have only two periods of when this type of peace and society existed upon the earth, first with Enoch and then with the Lamanites and Nephites in 4th Nephi. From the writings in 4th Nephi, we get a glimpse into what the millennium will be like. Following are nine things that we learn from 4th Nephi that enables us to get a view of what it will be like during the millennium. So here are nine things of what it will be like from 4th Nephi chapter 1. 1. 4th Nephi 1 2. Eventually all the people were converted to the Lord, and there was no contentions or disputations, and every man did deal justly one with another. President Marion Jerome in the first presidency gave the following insight regarding the meaning of the true conversion. Webster Dictionary says the verb convert means to turn from one belief or course to another that conversion is a spiritual and moral change. As used in the scriptures, converted generally implies not merely mental acceptance of Jesus and his teachings, but also a motivating faith in him and in his gospel, a faith which works a transformation, an actual change in one's understanding of life's meaning and his allegiance to God, in interest, in thought, and in conduct. If one who is wholly converted desire for things Eminical, meaning contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, has actually died and substituted, therefore, is a love of God with a fixed and controlling determination to keep his commandments. I'm sorry, let me read that prayer and send it again. In one who is wholly converted, desire for things contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ has actually died. And substituted thereof is the love of God with a fixed and controlling determination to keep his commandments. 
From this it would appear that membership in the church and conversion are not necessarily synonymous. Being converted and having a testimony are not necessarily the same thing either. A testimony comes when the Holy Ghost gives to the earnest seeker a witness of the truth. A moving testimony vitalizes faith, that is, it induces repentance and obedience to the commandments. Conversion, on the other hand, is the fruit of or the reward for repentance and obedience. End of President Romney's quote. What would it take in today's world to build a society that did not have any contention or disputations? President Spencer W. Kimball taught how this goal can be achieved. First, we must eliminate the individual tendency to selfishness that snares the soul, sinks the heart, and darkens the mind. Second, we must cooperate completely and work in harmony with one another. Third, we must lay on the altar and sacrifice whatever is required by the Lord. We begin by offering a broken heart and a contrite spirit. End of quote. Elder Sheldon F. Childs of the Seventh explained what it meant to deal justly with one another when he spoke about honesty and integrity. Quote, when we say we will do something, we do it. When we make a commitment, we honor it. When we give, are given a calling, we fulfill it. When we borrow something, we return it. When we have a financial obligation, we pay it. When we enter into agreements, we keep it. End of quote. President N. Eldon Tanner of the First Presidency illustrated the importance of dealing justly with others. A young man came to me not long ago and said, I made an agreement with a man that requires me to make certain payments each year. I am in arrears, meaning behind in fulfilling financial obligations, and I cannot make those payments. For if I do, it is going to cause me to lose my house. What shall I do? I looked at him and said, keep your agreement, even if it costs me my home. I said, I am not talking about your home. I am talking about your agreement. And I think your wife would rather have a husband who would keep his word and have to rent a home than to have a home with a husband who will not keep his covenants and pledges. End of quote. Number two, and fourth Nephi one. Verse 3, they had all things common among them. Therefore, they were not rich nor poor nor bond nor free, but they were all made free. One of the attributes that distinguished the Nephite people was that they had all things in common. President Marion G. Romney described that this phrase means, what this phrase means and how it worked. Quote, this procedure, the United Order, preserved in every man the right of private ownership and management of his property. Each man owned his portion, which at his option he could alienate, keep, and operate, or otherwise treat as his own. He consecrated to the church the surplus he produced above the needs and wants of his own family. This surplus went into the storehouse from which stewardships were given to others and from which the needs of the poor were supplied. End of quote. President Romney also explained that what leads a people to live in such a way? Quote, when we reach the state of having the pure love of Christ, our desire to serve one another will have grown to the point where we will be living fully the law of consecration. Living the law of consecration exalts the poor and humbles the rich. In the process, both are sanctified. The poor, released from the bondage and humiliating limitations of poverty, are enabled as free men to rise to their full potential, both temporally and spiritually. The rich, by consecration and imparting their surplus for the benefit of the poor, not by constraint, but willingly as an act of free will, of evidence that charity for their fellow men characterized by Mormon as the pure love of Christ. This will bring both the giver and receiver to common ground on which the Spirit of God can meet them. End of quote. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how we are preparing to live the law of consecration. Quote, the law of tithing prepares us to live the higher law of consecration, to dedicate and give all of our time, talents, and resources to the work of the Lord. Until the day when we are required to live this higher law, we are commanded to live the law of tithe, which is to freely give one-tenth of our income annually. End of quote. Number three, fourth Nephi one five, there were great and marvelous works wrought by the disciples of Jesus. We are the servants of the Lord, who is our master, and he has commanded us to labor in his fields, plowing, sowing, cultivating, and harvesting. That is, we are the agents of the Lord, 
who is our eternal principle, and he has empowered us to repent, I'm sorry, to represent him and do the things he would do if he were personally present. When we do all things in his name and righteousness, it means that we put ourselves in his place instead, that we think and speak and act as he would in the same situation. It means we live our lives as though we were the one whose blessed name we bear. Our acts become his acts. They are done in his name. Number four, fourth Nephi 1, 7, the Lord did prosper them exceedingly in the land. We do not prosper ourselves. We do not, as the humanist affirms, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It is true that we must work, lab work and labor and strive to do our best. We must do our part. But whenever we obtain blessings, whenever we are prospered, it is because God Almighty has elected to give us those blessings. Indeed, we are indebted to him for every breath we take. See Mosiah 2.21 those who acknowledge his hand in all things, who in gratitude and humility offer credit where it is due, tend to avoid the perils of the prosperity cycle. Number five, fourth Nephi one ten, the people of Nephi did wax strong and did multiply exceedingly fast and became exceedingly fair and delightsome people. The blessings of the Lord were poured out upon the people, they become fair, meaning clean, pure, free from the influence of the world, and delightsome meaning very pleasing, delightful. Number six, fourth Nephi four, thirteen and fifteen, there was no contention among all the people on all the land. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the source of the great peace that was described in fourth Nephi, quote, Personal peace is reached when one in humble submissiveness truly loves God. Heed carefully this scripture. Thus love God Thus, love of God should be our aim. It is the first commandment, the foundation of faith. As we develop love of God and Christ, love of family and neighbor will eventually follow. Then we will eagerly emulate Jesus. He healed, he comforted, he taught. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Through the love of God, the pain caused by the fiery canker of contention will be extinguished from the soul. This healing begins with a personal vow. Let peace, let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. This commitment will then spread to family, friends, and will bring peace to neighborhoods and nations. Shun contention. Seek godliness. Be enlightened by eternal truth. Be like-minded with the Lord in love and unity. Uni and unite with him in faith. Then shall the peace of God, which path of all understanding, be yours to bless you and your posterity through generations yet to come. End of quote. Number seven, fourth Nephi one sixteen. There were no envies, no strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lines, nor mur murderers, nor any manner of lasciviousness. All had their hearts turned towards the Savior and his atonement, allowing them to keep out the malignant aspects of mortality to enter into their hearts. Number eight, fourth Nephi one seventeen, they were in one the children of Christ. The children of Christ are those who have come out of the world, who have left the loneliness and estrangement of a fallen condition and entered the realm of divine experience. They have forsaken the orphanage of spiritual alienation and have, received, have been received into the family and household of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have left the ranks of the nameless and take upon them the blessed name of Jesus Christ. They are Christians. Through their master they become, in time, joint heirs to all that the Father has. Number 9, 4 Nephi 1, They had become exceedingly rich because of their prosperity in Christ, because of their willingness to follow Christ. And the pros they, they prospered. They, sorry, they prospered, which can be a mixed blessing. The Lord is the Lord is bound to bless us when we follow Him. However, prosperity is one of the main reasons people turn to pride and are overcome with arrogance, self, stiff neckedness, and lovers of themselves more than the love of their fellow man. Somehow, brothers and sisters, we have to learn to endure posterity and stay humble. The Nephites never did figure it out. 
Thus we see that the blessings and conditions during the millennium when Christ will reign will be beyond our greatest expectations. However, it is up to us on how long those conditions last as we follow or deny the Savior and his teachings. We know that towards the end of the millennium that Satan will be loosed for a season. In 4th Nephi, we learn what conditions will lead to that loosening to take place. Because in 4th Nephi, after 200 years, they started to loosening Satan in their lives and wickedness reoccurred among this once delightsome people. So let's take a look at what may cause that loosening of Satan at the end of the millennium. Number one, 4th Nephi 120. There was still peace in the land, save it were a small part of the people who had revolted from the church and taken upon the name of Lamanites. Therefore, there began to be Lamanites again in the land. Division is the great stumbling block to the unity required for a Zion society. Why would it matter to a people what they are called? Why would it be so important for them to be called Lamanites? Why would a group choose to forsake the transcendent privileges of unity in order to be designated by this or that name? The answer is simple. Pride. A desire to be different. A yearning to be acknowledged. A fear of being overlooked. A craving for public notice. The righteous feel no need for attention. No desire to be praised. No inclination to demand recognition. The prideful demand their rights even when they are wrong. The prideful feel that they must do things their way, even when that way is the wrong way. The prideful insist that they must pursue their own path, even when the road they take is wide and broad and leads to destruction. Number 2, 4 Nephi 124. Those who are lifted up pride, such as the wearing of costly apparel and all manner of fine pearls and of the fine things of the world, Several times in the Book of Mormon history, the people passed through a cycle of righteousness, prosperity, riches, pride, wickedness, destruction, humility, and righteousness again. Somehow we will have to learn how to become blessed by the Lord, prosper, and yet stay humble. Number three, 4 Nephi 1, 26-27, they began to be divided into class, and they began to build up churches unto themselves to get gain. The awful demon of pride manifested here in clothing and jewelry and in indifference to the needs of others proved to be the death knell to the Nephites of Zion. Once the people begin to focus on themselves, they are no longer in a position to focus on the needs of others. The laws of consecration and stewardship can all operate only among a pure people, among the people who seek the interest of their neighbors and do all things with an eye single to the glory of God. In the absence of the proper motive, classes and cliques and castes soon arise. No doubt these false churches did many wicked deeds, things which would be horrify, which would horrify and offend the spiritually sensitive. Perhaps it was in an effort to epitomize their sins that Mormon elucidated one abomination in particular, the administration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to the unworthy. Number four. 4th Nephi 131, notwithstanding all these miracles, the people did harden their hearts and did seek to kill them. Faith does not come through signs, but rather signs follows those that believe. Because of their hard hearts, the people were oblivious to the miracles performed and thus sought to kill the three disciples who were to remain on earth as translated beings doing the work of God. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with some of the doctrines and principles in these chapters and helping you to come unto Christ. If it did, please hit the like button.